Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to today's uh, introductory lecture. I will be, in contrast to what we've been doing in the last few days, uh, go back in history a little bit and um, give you a, a bit of an impression of uh, the project that I'm currently working on, which is, uh, in a sense, a kind of historical genealogy of sectarian politics and sectarian identity formation uh, in the Islamic world. It's a kind of long durée global history of uh, particularly the relationship between the madhahib uh, in Islam um, and the ways in which they related to uh, different uh, political uh, entities and, and powers. So there are quite a lot of different uh, things that I discuss uh, in the book uh, before we get to the period that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, I, I discuss the kind of formation uh, uh, of the Madahib, I discuss the early splits, um, then I discuss the kind of first competing dynasties um, that, uh, that used one or the other interpretation of Islam for, to legitimize um, their rule. Um, and then eventually uh, I look at uh, the ways in which um, uh, you know, the, the Mongols and, and other people kind of you know, abolished uh, uh, the, caliph, the, caliph, the Abbasid Caliphate uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but what I want to kind of emphasize uh, in today's lecture is the period from about 1500 onwards uh, that coincides uh, with the period of confessionalization um, in Europe, uh, something that I'd uh, mentioned uh, on the first day. And uh, thus the talk, although you don't have a title in the program, is uh, called Confessionalization and State Formation in the Islamic World 1500 to about uh, 1900, although we see how far uh, we'll get, and I do have a second uh, lecture tomorrow morning uh, uh, in case, you know, uh, we don't really reach uh, uh, the 1900s. But so in a sense, tomorrow I mainly wanted to focus then on the 20th century and the modern state, the kind of arguments that we've been making. But I do think that um, uh, the, the kind of modernist argument that, um, you know, the, the, the sectarian identities became politically relevant uh, only in the in the kind of modern age in the area of imperialism and the modern state is a little bit too simplistic. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, it has its value and um, um, I, I partly subscribe to that notion as well. But I do think that the period immediately preceding this period, so from about 1500 to about 1800, so which is in European history usually called the early modern period, was particularly crucial um, also for the Islamic world and f particularly for the crystallization of uh, competing Sunni and Shi um, political identities. Um, and this had very, very important legacies in the kind of core states uh, of the of the Middle East or of the countries that we talk about, legacies that um, that live with us uh, until today. So, therefore, um, if you allow me, we will now go back uh, uh, into uh, history. So, I mean, most of you will probably be familiar with the broad outlines of the um, Ottoman Empire and so on and so forth. So, I'm not going to go into into too many details. But um, with the consolidation of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of the Safavids uh, in Iran, two neighboring Muslim empires espoused competing interpretations of Islam. The Ottomans, obviously, uh, a form of Hanafi Sunnism, and the Safavids, uh, a new form of Twelver Shiism, uh, Usuli Twelver Shiism, to secure their rule, both at home, but also to legitimize their foreign policy. So from the 16th until the 18th century, the region was characterized by the Ottoman Safavid rivalry, and part of that rivalry continued after the Safavids uh, with the Qajars um, uh, uh, later on in the 19th century. Both ruling dynasties legitimized their rule with reference to religion and tried to subvert the other in part by promoting their interpretation of Islam. It is at this point that Sunni-Shi de debates reach a new dimension associated with state power on both sides for a prolonged period of time. 
The consolidation of these two empires thus, thus rekindled the importance of sectarian identity in Islam and infused them with the key ingredient that would make later episodes of Sunni-Shi rivalry so explosive, and that is great power rivalry. Um, this rivalry would shape Sunni-Shi relations ever after. The competition of these two empires and their self-understanding as Sunni and Shi powers made the lives of adherents of the relative other sect in the respective other's territory harder, as they were suspected of harboring sympathies for a foreign power. This was particularly the case in the border regions between the two empires, such as in uh, Kurdistan or in Mesopotamia, which is today called Iraq. The two empires fought several devastating wars against each other, so that especially these border regions were characterized by a near constant state of war for much of the 16th century. The case of Ottoman Safavid relations is thus an early case of confessionalization with important lessons for the modern period. But it is also, if we look at these two dynasties, it is in some ways surprising that they became such strong uh, enemies, uh, and particularly that they it took these competing forms of Islam as their political ideologies because initially they were actually two very similar dynasties. They both um, uh, came from uh, Anatolia and both came out of a kind of Sufi uh, context in which um, the Ahlul Bayt had a particularly important role in, in, in popular religion but which was not very characterized by a very strong sectarian polarization. And in the beginning, obviously, as you all know, the Safavid uh, Sufi order in the 15th century was still nominally Sunni. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, but it is in this period that uh, the term Ahlul Baytism has now become kind of um, uh, uh, a descriptor for the ways in which religiosity um, was, was played out at that time. So in the period kind of pre preceding this era of confessionalization that I think started in about 1500. So in this period of Ahlul Baytism, um, Sufism straddled the lines between Sunnism and Shiism. It was kind of probably the dominant uh, form of, of popular religiosity uh, in large parts of the uh, of the Islamic world, and it is with the kind of split into the you know with the Safavid Ottoman rivalry that that uh, many Sufi orders uh, have to kind of choose uh, which side um, uh, they belong to. Although we do have a very interesting paper here in the Winter School that I'm very much looking forward to, which might uh, uh, shed new light uh, uh, on this and, and problematize this um, more, but. Nonetheless, um, uh, at some point in the late 15th century, uh, the Safavid family, the head of the Safavid family, Safi ad Din, uh, decides uh, in a dream, uh, 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 at least that's what he wrote in his poems, that he uh, uh, actually saw himself um, as a, a, a spiritual figure and that he wanted to uh, uh, change, um, uh, well, to become a, a 12 a Shi and um, uh, thus changed uh, his Sufi order from, from a Sunni Sufi order to a, to a Shi Sufi order. And this broadly coincided with the first kind of territorial, uh, uh, larger territorial conquests uh, in Iran, and thus led to a kind of top-down uh, conversion of Iran um, to uh, 12 Shiism. Because one of the things that is also often forgotten is that uh, Iran was uh, uh, Sunni for as long as it was Shi. Um, uh, and it is only in this period that you have really a top-down conversion campaign that in the end is, is really quite successful in, uh, in converting most of the population um, to 12 Shiism and a process that while not uh, carried out necessarily with the means of the modern state, um, is, is, is nonetheless uh, really quite effective. So um, uh, over a period of a couple of decades, really this very large country shifts from one uh, uh, denomination um, to the other and people who don't want to uh, go along are either killed, uh, exiled, or have to hide their beliefs. Um, so that by the end of the 16th century, um, Iran is really uh, largely 
um, uh, largely Xi. Uh, in this new state, in the Safavid state, uh, what is also really important is the, um, uh, uh, is the importance of, of clerics in the administration. These clerics um, uh, famously uh, come from many of the most famous clerics had to come from outside of Iran. Um, this is the famous story of the Lebanese uh, uh, from Jebel Amel um, or from Iraq or uh, even from Bahrain, uh, from the larger Bahrain area. All the centers of 12 Shiism clerics are recruited to go and work in the administration in Iran to become judges and, and oversee this conversion uh, campaign. And it's also thus in this period that you have a really a uh, much stronger interaction between, in a sense, the Iranian uh, Shiism and the Arab uh, Shi worlds, and, and the kind of networks of migration that um, have existed um, ever since, and, and networks of, of clerical um, you know, patronage and, and intermarriage and so on date back um, to, to this period. Um, and it is also, it set a precedent in a way for the ways in which um, uh, uh, Shi clerics, um, you know, well, were involved in the administration um, of a state, a precedent that after 1979 was very important for, for uh, uh, Iranian um, history um, uh, again. On the other hand, on the Ottoman side, uh, the emergence of the, the, the Safavid state had also very important consequences um, for the Ottomans. Um, the Ottomans uh, uh, around this time in the late 15th century are are obviously expanding their power dramatically. They conquer um, uh, Constantinople, uh, uh, Istanbul in the mid 15th century, um, and and uh, conquer you know large parts of the uh, of 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 the eastern uh, 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 and and southern Mediterranean. Um, and um, uh, they obviously have this rivalry with the Habsburgs and with other uh, European powers, with Venice and so on and so forth. And uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, in that rivalry, there's obviously a clear um, uh, religious dimension in the sense uh, that the wars are legitimized religiously and there's a mirroring that has now been studied quite well in a sense between the, the Turks and, uh, and, and you know, the, the Austrians. Um, that have that had to a certain extent has influenced uh, the image of, of of the relative other side uh, in later periods. Um, this kind of the constant fights with the uh, with the European powers um, and the religious dimension there um, thus leads to a kind of uh, to a kind of to the Ottoman Sultan legitimizing himself more strongly in, in religious terms, um, also in the rivalry with the Russian uh, Tsar. Um, and, uh, but if we look at kind of the Islamic world, we have a kind of, we, this, the rivalry with the Safavids is really what adds a second dimension to this kind of reinforcing notion of religious legitimacy. And that is that the sectarian identity becomes more and more important in the uh, Ottoman state legitimization, uh, uh, well, of the Ottoman uh, project and one of the ways in which this is played out is, um, uh, as I think you mentioned also uh, yesterday, is uh, with the problem of the of the Kizilbash, um, uh, the which uh, later are called uh, Alevis, although that is partly uh, disputed because the Safavid uh, order, the Safavid Sufi order, had um, significant followers in Anatolia that, however, uh, resided in, in what was Ottoman territory. And um, after the Safavids established their own state, um, uh, this obviously became a big problem for the Ottomans. And after the Safavids adopted 12 Shiism, this was not only a political problem, but it was also a religious problem. And so the Ottoman state started a campaign to, to really crack down on these uh, Kizilbash uh, supporters of the Safavids. Um, and there are many, many reports in the Ottoman archives of uh, persecution, uh, uh, you know, movement of people, um, and so on and so forth, um, uh, of the Kizilbash. What is still not entirely clear is uh, whether this, you know, the, and then in this context you have the issuing of, of, of many fatwas, you have the strengthening, uh, in a sense, of the clerical, the Ottoman official clergy, um, and they issue many fatwas against, particularly against the Safavids, um, but also against their supporters, so that means the Kizilbash, 
one of the things that is not entirely clear and fluctuates over time is whether the Ottomans and the Ottoman clerics in, this, in these fatwas always meant Shiism in general um, or particularly the Safavid state and its supporters. Um, uh, and this, this, as I say, fluctuates um, uh, over time. Um, but what is very clear is that the rivalry, as soon as it starts, and it starts almost immediately after the Safavids established their, their initial state in 1501, um, the first wars start uh, just a few years uh, later. From then on, really, the, the kind of, uh, well, in Iran, most Sunnis get converted to Shiism, but in the Ottoman Empire, which is much larger and has rules over a vi wide variety uh, of populations, there are uh, strong, uh, Twelve Shi and other communities that are broadly part of the Shi worlds or that do not fit uh, into the Hanafi, uh, well, dominant school, um, the Ottomans actually adopt a, a more nuanced approach. So apart from the Kizilbash, which are really targeted uh, heavily, um, uh, you know, one of the ways in which the Kizilbash populations manage to survive um, is in fact by uh, entering uh, some of the Sufi orders that uh, that also come out of this milieu that I mentioned before, this Ahl al Bayti milieu of the 15th century, in which kind of which straddled the line between Sufism, uh, uh, Sunnism, um, and Shiism. So the most famous of these Sufi orders was the Bektashi order. Um, uh, and uh, the Bakhtashi order in the end became kind of something like the, the elite military uh, uh, wing uh, or, or trained the elite military wing, the Janissaries uh, of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, in a sense, um, heterodox, I mean, the, the, the Kizilbash populations that uh, did not revolt any longer entered in some ways Ottoman state service through, this Kizilba, uh, through the Bektashi order uh, and uh, this is in, in itself a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon and um, in some ways also problematizes the idea that, you know, there was this, you know, there was this very sectarian uh, 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 conflict. Um, um, but, um, you know, and I'm happy to talk a bit more about the Bektashis, uh, although it's a bit of a niche, I mean, it's a bit of a niche topic, but I actually did, did quite some, you know, research uh, amongst kind of the Bektashi order uh, uh, early, you know, this year, and uh, it's really a very fascinating uh, story because as the rivalry goes on, the Bektashis actually then start to fight, obviously on the side of the Ottomans, uh, uh, also against uh, the Safavids. And uh, the Bektashi uh, order and the Janissaries have on their on their main flag, on the on the standard of the Janissaries, is the Zulfikar, the sword of Ali. So in a sense. Um, eventually, the Ottoman Empire used this, you know, you have used their elite military force, which has on its flag the sword of Ali, to fight the Safavids. So you see, the more you get into the details here, the more complicated it becomes. And and Ali being obviously a kind of key figure for Sunnis, but also in a sense the founding father for the uh, for the Shia. So so in a sense. Um, uh, this period is is very very important, but it's not obviously exclusive uh, uh, exclusively just um, just one just one thing um, or the other. But to get back to the other kind of Shi populations in the Ottoman Empire, the Ottomans actually adopt quite an interesting policy towards uh, the rest of the population. So, for example. Uh, in Lebanon, nowadays Lebanon, in Jebel Amel and the Bekaa, there are old uh, Twelve Shi populations, and there uh, the Ottomans actually, uh, you know, uh, employ uh, 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 Shia and all, uh, as 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 leaders, as uh, tax farmers, and do not uh, really treat them uh, very differently. Uh, from the way in which they would uh, they would treat others. I mean, one other interesting fact about um, uh, the Ottoman Empire is that while the Ottomans never recognized uh, Shiism as an official madhab uh, of Islam, so they were never officially employed uh, Shi judges that were allowed to judge according to uh, Jafari Fiqh, um, they, they actually um, they, they didn't classify uh, Shia as non-Muslims, they just classified them as Muslims. So there was never a different, there was never a separate um, uh, inheritance law or a separate um, personal status law uh, for the Shia. But on the other hand, so this meant that Ottomans saw them as Muslims, um, 
but they didn't want to give them special recognition. So why is this important? It's important because in the area, in the era of, of colonialism and, and the kind of modern state, uh, the judiciary and personal status law becomes a really important field of, of debate and also of crystallization of, of sectarian um, identities. And uh, I'll bring that up, um, bring that up later. But also, obviously important is that um, the key battleground in this field, apart from Ali in this rivalry, apart from Anatolia, were the, was Iraq. And, and, and in Iraq, um, as you're well aware, um, lies uh, uh, the tomb of Abu Hanifa, who is the founder of the Hanafi uh, uh, Madhab, uh, the Hanafi legal school that uh, the Ottomans uh, adopted as, as, sta as their state state religion, but at the same time uh, are the, the, the graves, the tombs of, uh, of, the, of, of what the Shia uh, consider uh, a number of their uh, imams. So, um, and obviously Baghdad and, and, and Kufa and so on are the old sites of, of the early, of the early, uh, you know, early Islamic history, very, very important sites are the sites of the original original uh, Sunni Shi and, and, and Khawarij split, and so on, a very symbolically loaded uh, territory. And um, uh, it is uh, Iraq that is kind of contested between the two sides. And it is also in, in that contest that then the kind of sectarian uh, polemics become, become quite important. But we do have to say that the Safavids um, are usually much harsher than the Ottomans in their treatment uh, uh, of uh, of the relative uh, uh, others. So the Safavids, for example, destroy the tomb of Abu Hanifa uh, at one time when they conquer Iraq. But the Ottomans, on the other hand, they, they don't destroy the, uh, the tombs of the, of the Shi Imams. Um, uh, uh, they, they actually, the Ottoman sultans want to be accepted as leaders of all Muslims and therefore also uh, allow pilgrimage uh, to these sites um, uh, while they while they control, uh, while they control Najaf, Karbala, um, uh, Kazimain, and uh, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, we do have actually some quite interesting uh, dynamics there. But on the other hand, because of this frequent conquest of one of the other side, the kind of sectarian question remains very relevant and uh, becomes highly, you know, debated and uh, and and well, just becomes an issue of kind of public. Um, uh, discussions uh, in in this period. So, from the 16th century uh, onwards, then these two rival Muslim empires use different interpretations of Islam to legitimize themselves, and the period is thus crucial in in a number of ways. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the importance uh, on the Shi side is that you, for the first time uh, in history, had for a prolonged period of time, clerics playing a major role in a state, and also the, the Usuli version of 12 Shiism in which clerics uh, you know, issue uh, decrees and, and you have to follow clerics um, uh, in, 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 in religious, um, uh, religious rulings for daily life and so on and so forth. Um, uh, uh, becomes the dominant form, and that will stay the se stay that way uh, uh, forever. Um, so the, on the on the on that side, the Safavids were in incredibly um, important. Uh, at the same time, in the Ottoman Empire, a process of uh, state centralization and consolidation and expansion abroad. Um, as well as the challenge by the Safavids and their supporters on Ottoman soil, led to a strengthening of Hanafi Sunnism as central to the raison d'etat and as a legitimizing uh, tool. And so um, uh, you have the really quite drastic expansion of the clerical class, of uh, clerical education, um, uh, and so on and so forth uh, in the Ottoman state. And in response to these rebellions, you have much tighter control of some of these rural communities um, and, and, and much more knowledge production about uh, you know, what these communities do and what their religious practices are and so on and so forth. And the state trying to more closely intervene into how uh, religious practices uh, uh, well, are done and, and whether or not they are loyal uh, to the state. Um, in this process, then, the Shia in the Ottoman Empire, broadly speaking, became an internal other, much like the Sunnis in the Safavid state, um, who would either be converted or expelled to a large extent. And some of the kind of 
uh, leading uh, uh, clerics and intellectuals actually fled to the Ottoman Empire where they started writing polemics uh, against the Safavids. So um, you already had at that point this kind of the politics of exile and clerical migration um, that would also characterize uh, later periods. This period thus left uh, lasting scars in the multi-ethnic and multi-religious borderlands between the two states uh, where the wars were fought out, uh, mainly in Anatolia, but also in, in Syria, the Levant, broadly speaking, and, and Iraq. The almost two and a half centuries in which Ottomans and Safavids controlled rival empires, so the Safavids get deposed in 1722, so from 1501 to 1722, this period was just of profound importance uh, and allows us to draw a number of important lessons for the question of at what point sectarian identity became relevant politically. For it were not the Shi beliefs of the Safavids or their supporters per se, or the Hanafi interpretation of Sunni Islam of the Ottomans that was the cause of the rivalry. As we have seen, the period was in fact characterized by a fair amount of religious ambiguity with the worshipping of the Ahlul Bayt common across the Ottoman Empire. It was when this sectarian identity became related to state power, in particular to the power of a rival state, that it attained political explosiveness and led to harsh reactions. For let us not forget that many of the Ottoman Kizilbash supporters of the Safavids saw the Safavid Shahs as their spiritual leaders, in some cases paid taxes to them, and wanted to serve in their armed forces, and some of them did. And it were these factors, and not the beliefs per se, that drew uh, the reactions of the Ottomans, um, even if they, in the end, then reacted by policing the beliefs uh, of the Kizilbash. So I think, actually, this is quite important uh, to keep in mind. Uh, so a complex process that in later political science literature has been called securitization, and in our context, sectarianization, played thus out uh, across the Islamic lands uh, in the early modern period. It is also in this period that religious polemics uh, get a newfound meaning um, in the legitimization of political f power against internal and external enemies. So both sides uh, have their key clerics uh, declare, uh, you know, the others as unbelievers and declare, uh, a whole, you know, legitimate war, jihad, um, uh, on the other based on the unbelief of the relative um, other side. Um, and it is in this period that we also see a kind of revitalization of all the polemics uh, that were previously mainly circulating in manuscript form in, uh, you know, in, in, in fairly elite and, and niche uh, circles um, uh, and, and were propagated more widely. Um, still not really yet in print in this period, um, but uh, you know, through reading out uh, in mosques and, and just wider um, uh, copying and dissemination. But at the same time, b despite all the examples of hostility and polemic, the two empires frequently made peace with each other, um, toned down their sectarian rhetoric, and in particular in the case of the Ottomans, ruled over large Shi populations without the anti-Shi rhetoric determin determining the day-to-day -day interactions between them uh, and their subjects. And while the period saw a sharper delineation of boundaries on both sides, uh, these boundaries, the sectarian boundaries, continue to be fluid as the legacy of, for example, Ali's sword as the symbol of the Ottoman state and the many displays of Ali loyalties in the Ottoman Empire suggest. So, um, uh, you know, such images were, were all across the empire and all across the state uh, institutions um, uh, uh, as well. And uh, for all the sharper delineation of sectarian boundaries over the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, a very serious attempt at Sunni-Shi rapprochement could also be made uh, just after the fall um, uh, of the Safavids. So, um, uh, in a sense, I think this period was very important. I mean, first of all, it's also, you know, we're talking about two centuries, uh, 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 so, you know, of course, important things will happen in two centuries. But I do think that um, uh, uh, it was really important, particularly for the issue of Sunni-Shi relations. Because one of the problems is in, in the literature on sectarianism is, uh, is that we do really abstract uh, a lot from the literature on Lebanon, where you know, the story is really quite different in a sense uh, in which you know, European powers intervened on behalf of the Christians for a very long time. You have the legacy 
of the Crusades and then France with this legacy legitimizing its 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 hold on 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 the you know support of the Maronites and and Catholics particularly uh, in uh, in Lebanon. But if if you uh, if you look at some of the other uh, 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 contexts and particularly start to kind of read the history from the region in a sense, um, uh, one does get an idea that, uh, well, there were important periods of, you know, the, the, well, the politicization of, of sectarian identity um, uh, in, in, previous, uh, in previous periods. And so, I mean, I don't know how, uh, how long one should speak here. What's the uh, idea? We do have a bit of time, right? So um, then I would like to um, move on a little bit to the 18th century because in a sense, um, uh, after the, uh, obviously the Safavids are overthrown uh, by, by a new dynasty and eventually Nader Shah, uh, the famous Nader Shah comes to, comes to power. And one of the things that, and, and it, it, this Nader Shah is, is interesting uh, conceptually here because uh, with him we can kind of test uh, to what extent um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the important, to what extent sectarian rivalry is important here or to what extent it was actually imperial rivalry uh, using uh, a sectarian identity uh, uh, in this rivalry. Because Nader Shah uh, mainly um, you know, overthrew the Safavids and then mainly wanted to differentiate himself from the Safavids. Uh, and to do that, he's, he, he, he said that I'm actually going to revert to the true Islam and um, uh, I'm going to abolish the, the, particularly the Safavid practices that were seen as very problematic by the Ottomans uh, and by many Sunnis, such as the cursing uh, of the first three caliphs uh, accepted um, uh, by Sunnis, which was institutionalized uh, under the Safavids and a number of, of, of other popular practices. Um, and he uh, announced that uh, in, in, in several letters to the Ottomans that he would do that, and in return, uh, the Ottomans should um, accept um, uh, uh, the Jafari Mathab uh, as the fifth school uh, of, of Islam. And he said that in this Jafari Mathab, all these, uh, all these Shi practices that are very uh, problematic for Sunnis will not be included uh, and they will be sidelined and the Jafari Mathab will however be the Mathab uh, of, of the Iranians. And uh, to that effect, he actually organized uh, a conference in, um, in Najaf in uh, in the uh, in the 1730s, um, I think, and convened uh, Sunni and Shi clerics uh, to that effect to to come to an agreement to basically resolve the Sunni Shi issue once and for all. This was uh, uh, perhaps the most serious uh, attempt uh, ever so far um, in Islamic history to do that, um, and uh, uh, only you know perhaps at one point later in the Taqrib efforts uh, between the Azhar and, uh, and, and Qom and Nashaf in the 50s and 60s was this ever taken so seriously um, again. But uh, the Ottomans uh, refused to, to, to take part in this um, uh, and said that basically he was just a rebel and um, you know, he, he, should be, he could be killed already just for writing to the Sultan without, uh, without addressing him uh, uh, as caliph and, and submitting to him, um, uh, uh, yeah, well, for, for basically having a, a, a tr claiming political authority outside of the Ottoman uh, realm. And in the end, uh, uh, this, this uh, agreement uh, didn't lead anywhere. Uh, and I think it shows that, um, you know, there were really the kind of, you know, the imperial, um, well, the imperial dimension of the whole thing was, was more important in a sense the, than the sectarian uh, dimension. One of the reasons why Nader Shah also did all of this was because he started conquering large parts of Afghanistan and obviously famously raided uh, Delhi, uh, the, the capital of the Mughals, and, and which he destroyed and, and stole everything. Um, uh, and thus had many Sunni soldiers and subjects uh, 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 under his new uh, empire. So he wanted to diversify um, the, the base of, uh, of, his, uh, uh, of his empire. The Mughals uh, are also a very, very important part of this story, but um, I think I'm not going to uh, 
uh, go into too much detail uh, here. Uh, um, uh, uh, they are very interesting because despite the fact that they are somehow considered to be outside of this, uh, or, you know, of this, of this problem in a sense, the polemics between the Ottomans and Safavids also have repercussions uh, in the Mughal Empire and you actually have uh, then uh, uh, clerics employed at the Mughal courts or at smaller regional courts in India reacting to the polemics that are going on between, between, um, between Ottomans um, uh, and Safavids. So what then really changes uh, in the 18th century? Can anyone think of, of, of a new force that comes in that really, um, that adds a kind of third big dimension to, to the story that I've been telling so far of you know, two rival empires, the Ottomans, uh, Sunni, but somehow also you know, a bit laissez-faire towards Shiism and the Safavids with their you know, Iranian Shiism. Can some, someone think about what happens in the middle of the 18th century that uh, has a great impact on, 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 on Sunni Shi relations? And perhaps the professors, of course, are allowed to say. <laughs> but, I mean, if you would like to. Um, the millet system again is a is a I mean it's a good point. The millet system it's obviously you know it's mentioned a lot right in this debate. The problem is just that you know the the, the non-Sunni Muslim communities were never organized in the millet system, and they are really the large you know they're much larger populations than than Christians or Jews, which were organized in the millet system. Shia were never organized in the millet system. That's one of the things I tried to explain before, which is actually very interesting that they were never organized in a millet system. So they were in a kind of legal middle ground in a sense where they were actually considered just normal Muslims, but obviously they had some form of, so for example, they would go to their own clerics, for example, for marriage uh, or inheritance purposes or so on, but that was not necessarily recognized uh, by the state. So the millet system, I mean, a good point, but not what I was looking for right now. <laughs> I mean, again, that is, that is also very important. And I think it's in, in response to that, that the Ottomans uh, become, you know, start to see themselves more as, as an Islamic empire in the rivalry with the Russians. But, um, that is not necessarily, again, what I was looking for. But uh, in a sense, the movement that had also a very strong impact on this country that we are in now. I mean, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yes. Yes. The, the Muwahidun. So, because. The story that I've told you so far, actually, you know, then we should be having not such a bad time. I mean, if uh, if uh, if the Ottomans were, you know, fairly relaxed about uh, about Shiism and the Ahlul Bayt and so on, and Sufism was kind of in between, and only in times of war they would use it, then, you know, why are we having such a big problem, or why did such a big problem emerge in a sense between Sunnis and Shi'is? And I mean, I think it's uh, in the 18th century that, um, as uh, was mentioned, a kind of uh, revival, um, um, revivalist, several revivalist movements start to link themselves uh, uh, intellectually back to earlier periods uh, of polemics. Um, and particularly to the Hanbali uh, tradition, which was actually quite marginalized, um, uh, particularly also in the Ottoman Empire. And it is in that Hanbali tradition that you have the most, the strongest kind of anti-Shi uh, ideas built into, uh, into, the, into the legal school. And um, uh, that particularly becomes important in this part uh, of the world, so in, in the center of the Arabian Peninsula and nudged, as you all know, in the middle of the 18th century, uh, uh, a man by the name of uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab uh, starts, um, uh, goes uh, on a number of uh, study trips, uh, both to the east and to the west of the Arabian Peninsula, also to Basra, and encounters uh, many Sufi practices and encounters Shi practices, 
and uh, also uh, uh, a lot of things he calls uh, sorcery and so on and so forth and thinks one should purify the faith and go back to the basics uh, uh, of religion. And he particularly finds a spiritual father in a man named Ibn Taymiyyah that I'm sure you've also heard of who was uh, crucial and perhaps the most important um, Sunni polemic uh, uh, against Shiism um, uh, who, who wrote his, uh, his books when he tried to influence the, the Mamluks uh, uh, again uh, try, to try to influence a kind of political dynasty to take action um, against uh, what he saw as uh, uh, you know, uh, deviations uh, from the faith. And it is really uh, with the birth of the, you know, Wahhabis don't want to be called Wahhabis. It's a, it's a term that was used against uh, the Wahhabis. They like to be called Muwahidun, uh, uh, defenders of Tawhid, of the unity uh, 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 of, of religion. And, um, but uh, it is really with the kind of spreading of uh, um, uh, 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 the Wahhabi movement, uh, which can also be termed in a sense the early Salafia, um, uh, the early Salafi movement, and eventually throughout the 19th and the 20th century, the spread of these ideas around the world, that uh, some of the uh, ideas that were previously quite peripheral uh, become really accepted as, as mainstream in, in, many, in many Sunni uh, uh, contexts. And um, as you all know, um, the uh, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his descendants, his family, and, and uh, a number of his followers uh, form an alliance uh, with the local ruling dynasty in Najd, uh, the Al, Al Saud, and uh, together they then have a political project which is backed up by also a particular form of, of religion, and it's that, uh, that kind of religious dimension which differentiates the Al Saud from other ruling dynasties in, in Najd and other parts of Arabia which are basically based on local tribal loyalties or local loyalties and just you know raid each other and and they've been doing that for a long time the the the, the kind of wahhabi uh, ideas gave this new political project uh, ideological cohesion and probably was quite important uh, for why it actually managed to to then over time conquer most of the uh, Arabian uh, Peninsula. It's also important to keep in mind that the, they actually started as a revolt uh, against the Ottomans. So the Ottomans had uh, uh, other allies in that part of the world, particularly the Al-Rashid, um, and uh, obviously Mecca and Medina, the Hijaz, were ruled uh, by the Sharifs of Mecca, who also ruled on behalf of the Ottomans. So um, the, 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 the Saudi Wahhabi forces actually came in, in, in confrontation with the Ottomans, first and foremost, um, but at the same time moved very strongly against uh, Shi communities in the eastern province in Al-Aqsa and Khatif. Uh, and then in the early 19th century, uh, obviously famously went into uh, into Iraq and uh, destroyed the tombs in Najaf and, and Karbala, uh, kind of traumas that, that are until today uh, very you know, important in, in Shi collective memory and in Iraqi uh, collective um, memory. So for example, when I was, uh, when I was in the, when I visited these shrines uh, uh, as part of my field work, you could still buy you know, posters allegedly depicting that uh, just outside the shrines. And, uh, and so uh, these are stories that are constantly, again, being picked up also in the context of, uh, you know, of ISIS, where there was a lot of polemics from the Shi side that ISIS is basically just, uh, you know, Wahhabi uh, uh, re-emerging um, uh, and so on and, uh, and, and so forth. But I do think that kind of the, the, this kind of third uh, uh, dimension, which all, so in a sense, the Salafia, um, uh, uh, is, is really, really important. And uh, we have a number of other revivalist movements, uh, particularly also uh, in Yemen, um, where uh, uh, a number of people, uh, most famously of Shaukani, uh, start to embrace some of some similar ideas. Um, and then they also get uh, really prominent, become quite prominent in India um, uh, amongst uh, a number of, uh, of people there. Um, and it is all these movements together, in a sense, uh, that, that at the end of the day um, become quite uh, anti-Shia in their particular uh, context and also anti-Sufi. And they are the kind of ideological forefathers of some of the, of some of the kind of modern uh, 
uh, uh, Salafi or, or you know, movements that um, that are actually carrying out a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the you know violence and so on um, uh, against um, against the uh, Shi communities um, and. Uh, so on and uh, so forth. So I think um, I will leave it uh, there. Um, I wanted to give you uh, an idea of, of uh, in a sense, three big political movements, um, three big, I mean, two empires and one uh, third kind of religious political movement that will uh, eventually take many different forms, uh, the Salafi movement. Uh, the Salafi movement um, uh, uh, also has, you know, eventually in the late 19th century becomes, uh, uh, also has a branch that, that calls very strongly for Islamic unity, so um, in the face of, of European colonialism. Um, uh, that branch at that point also gets called the Salafia, so people like Mohammed Abdu and uh, Rashid Rida um, uh, in, 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 in Cairo. Um, for a while, they actually tried to bring uh, Sunnis and Shis together, also bring the Zaydis of, of Yemen very much into, uh, into the kind of mainstream and so on and so forth. But um, eventually that trend uh, uh, loses out towards what can be termed the right wing of the Salafia uh, and also this crucial figure, Rashid Rida, um, eventually adopts uh, the kind of classical anti-Shi uh, uh, narrative of the Hanbali movement and moves very close to, to, to the kind of Saudi Wahhabi uh, position. And uh, through Rashid Rida, who then, um, uh, it is him and his publishing house that that republish a lot of uh, the old kind of polemics, uh, including the whole works of Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and all of the clerics uh, uh, that, that kind of come from this line um, in a famous publishing house uh, in, in Cairo, and spread these ideas really uh, across the uh, Islamic world. So, so um, uh, by the late 19th century, you do have kind of the, 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 the starting of, of a real kind of print culture um, uh, printing of religious texts, which previously was not uh, not favored or not allowed, partly, and it is in that context of the kind of print uh, uh, culture that also a lot of these earlier polemics that that might have been almost forgotten um, become become more available and also become available in 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 in, in contexts where you know they're very far away from these from these core debates, such as in in India uh, uh, and uh, and elsewhere, and so. Um, it is, I think, really with these three kind of broad um, well, movements um, that we can explain in the kind of pre-modern period um, uh, why sectarian identity starts to become you know, more relevant uh, politically. And um, uh, I was talking quite freely here, um, uh, so I hope you forgive me if, if some of the things were a bit um, uh, erratic or I was jumping from one to the other and I'd be very happy to answer uh, any questions uh, uh, you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you.